Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. And we have today, we're so lucky, we have Ben Arenkeel, <laughs> one of the great neuroscientists in this room. I mean, of all time. And Just we're, we're flattering, excited. flattering. <laughs> the flattery starts now. So uh, I, I want to clarify one thing right off the bat. Um, you are, you're, you're from Minnesota, mm -hmm. and you went to uh, University of St. Minnesota, St. Cloud, Cloud State. St. Cloud State yeah. University. And you're not from Montreal, right? No, no, okay. no a okay. better half of that. So. Yeah, I, I'd like to show you this. Oh. oh, this is the picture of the St. Cloud State Huskies emblem. Legendary hockey. And this is the Montreal Canadiens. Can you see a difference there? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the copyright it, lies, uh, is, laws are out there, in Minnesota. Is there a small trophy there, <laughs> in this? There's nothing no. there. Actually, if they put huskies, it would be yeah. a dead duplicate. <laughs> Just wanna <laughs> wanted you to know your your institution should be like I don't know endorsed endorsed, endorsed or letter should yeah. be a lawsuit. So uh, so Ben does or Dr. Aaron Keel does some of the coolest science around because it is really around how this complicated brain forms networks that actually end up pro providing function. So first of all, I have to tell my sister because she's going to sit there, oh, God, no, no, neuroscience. Like how many neurons are there in the brain? You know, just about. Billions. 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 90 billion, 80 billion, something like that? 100 billion. 100 billion. 100 billion. Okay. 100 billion. And yet, so this is the trouble with anatomists, right? They look at that and they go, how can you possibly mm -hmm. figure this out? And yet somehow through development and behavior and time, these networks are created that actually produce functions. So how, like as an anatomist looking at it, it's almost impossible to figure out, how do you, what kind of techniques do you use to figure out how networks form? So it started early days with, with developmental studies where we would label things with simple dyes and lipids. And nowadays we've um, kind of escalated in the genetic world where we genetically engineered neurons, their circuits, and their intact connect connections, uh, largely with viruses and genetically okay. engineered mice, in order to basically directly visualize them with fluorescent proteins that come from coral, jellyfish, different types of glowing proteins that <laughs> we can directly see under Okay, so let me get this. You're traveling all over the world to places where you can vacation to collect the reagents so you can study mice. Well, I've been working on that with <laughs> Baylor College of Medicine for the travel funds, but they, they yeah. seem to keep cut falling through the, Claire, the, the Travel the funds, cut that, yeah. <laughs> so now do you use, what you, you mentioned mice, do you use other kinds of animal uh, to look at development? So our lab may, mainly uses mice. Uh, throughout the, the whole department, through o Baylor and, and the field in general, all sorts of organisms are useful for this. Really to simplify the billions of neurons that we know that are in the brain, we can use anything from worms to flies to mice, okay. um, other types of mammals. Uh, we leverage mice because it's genetically engineering. Right. We have anything we can do with them. Oh, that's very cool. So one of the things I was reading that you've been uh, studying is the impact or the, the way networks form to, to suppress or it, uh, increase appetite. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of behavior disorders that are associated with eating, uh, especially in adolescents and young folks. What, what kind of insights have you gotten around eating disorders from your, your studies? So interestingly, I, we should probably back up a little bit, and we didn't start we back by up. looking at eating disorders per se. We okay. were looking at mechanisms to, um, which uh, help brain plasticity and, and what forms connections in the brain. What does, what, <laughs> what is brain, brain, what is brain plasticity? It's basically the health of the connections okay. that are formed between the neurons. Um, it, they allow neurons to change and the connections to change so we can learn. It's part of our memory. It's part of our processing of everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, um, it's to deal with our environment and all the sensory okay. input that we have to deal with. Okay, so to get back to eating the appetite. disorders and so, appetite. So we identified a class of molecules that we think build be better brain connections that are important for brain health, and in fact the same connections that go bad with neurodegenerative disease. Um, we decided to interrogate some of those connections in the peptides signaling molecules that are associated with building those better brain connections and better brain plasticity. When we started genetically mm -hmm. tinkering around with the centers that emit these signals, um, we uncovered serendipitously um, eating disorders in mice. Now, <laughs> this is a far cry from plasticity, but really it's one of the easiest things you can see in a mouse is um, they live in a small cage. We don't... <laughs> Unless we don't, you're in New York City, then that's the same equivalent of an apartment. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so one of the first things we had noticed in these animals where we, we um, were 
manipulating the molecules associated with brain plasticity is that they change their eating habits. Okay. There's a few things mice do very often do well. Eating is one of them. And yeah, um, yeah. The, the other ones were altered also. There's other behaviors and habits that, that we all know rodents do. Right. But eating was a real easy one to interrogate. So let me ask you, so Friedman's group did a lot of this on leptins and mm -hmm. it was hormonal. This is different, I'd say. So what we learned, getting back to how the plasticity yeah. plays a role in all of this, is that there's many mechanisms in the brain that are associated with eating, mm -hmm. sleep, thermal regulation, basic body functions that humans and all mammals have. Um, eating is one of those. It's evolutionarily mm -hmm. conserved. Um, this is a relay between our body and our brain. And what we, in, in this particular study, brain plasticity, we found that it's, this was brain signaling itself that changed eating habits I see. and changed the physiology of the mice themselves. The, the best news is that eating is an evolutionary important <laughs> thing to do. So if you're watching, be sure to, eat, keep, be sure eating. to keep, eating. keep eating. It's a good thing. Yes. So uh, one of the things, I mean, I'm a new grandfather. That my friend, my first grandchild. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. And to me, it's like one giant, besides the recombinant DNA experiment, it is an amazing neuroscience experiment. Mm -hmm. So I have been watching uh, hit this kid discover like parts of his body, like his mm -hmm. hands, his fingers, his toes. And what's, it, what's interesting to me is you can see these networks actually uh, evolving and developing. So with all these billions of opportunities and connections, how does behavior in the animal translate to a connected n network that leads to a behavior, you know, another behavior? Yeah, that's, that's one of the main things we all study in neuroscience. It's basically exercising the connections between the neurons in the brain. The billions of neurons, they are all um, kind of an open palette for activity mm -hmm. and for um, uh, plasticity and, and pliability and possibility. And the more it, in particular, your grandchild, did you say grandson? Grandson. Grandson. Yeah. Um, for example, one real easy thing to, to envision, like you said, you, mm -hmm. you see it directly, is, is movement control. Right. They're exploring their bodies, mm -hmm. and the, one, the, the mechanisms and movements that work, those connections become stronger. Um, they become reinforced. And at the same time, that plasticity mechanisms, the same ones that we started talking about, they reinforce the good connections and they eliminate the, the useless ones. So this is the whole fundamental <laughs> of plasticity. 99% of my brain is currently useless, so <laughs> it's being eliminated. It's, well, Billy, that's all of yours, so, you know. <laughs> but, that's, but that's true for, um, we've all heard that we only use 10% of our yeah, brains. Maybe it's 1%. Time. That's, that's right. Some of us. <laughs> so that's really, that's interesting, because so one of the things you see, like in stroke patients, mm -hmm. is the loss of movement. What those connections that haven't been used, are there ways to rewire in disease so that you can get better from a, an impairment of uh, function? Yes, I mean, I think that that's, that's one of the fundamental directions and avenues right now for fixing stroke and, and uh, local trauma, especially if it happens in the central nervous system and it's not in the periphery. Um, yeah. The brain is plastic enough that with practice, exercise, and training, uh, we can rewire connections and uh, build the connections that are already there to make them more useful. Um, unfortunately, this is unlike your grandson. <laughs> adults, the plasticity yeah. window is really tight, and it uh, takes a lot more to open the plasticity window and to, to um, uh, re-invoke plasticity signaling mechanisms, whereas in your grandson, right. this, the plasticity mechanisms are, it's a floodgate right, right. now, and they, it's, it's all plasticity at that point. So, so if uh, neurons don't regenerate exactly, do they? I mean, so it, they have to find new connections around mm -hmm. dead areas or... Is that true? That's true. It's, um, neurons per se don't regenerate in most areas of mm -hmm. the brain. Some areas they do. There's two areas associated with, our, with your memory, the hippocampus, and uh, olfaction, the sense of smell. They're regenerative, but the rest of your brain is considered not to be regenerative in, in, in a steady state. However, the neurons themselves are very plastic. They can send out new connections. Uh, they, they have existing connections that are not functional. There's mm -hmm. Each neuron itself has up to 100,000 connections which um, by most estimates, a large component of those aren't functional, mm -hmm. but they beca can become functional um, if need be. So, so you mentioned olfaction, and mm -hmm. that's one of the things you study, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mice are particularly good at smelling stuff. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you study olfaction as a, as a 
as, as a model for the rest of brain plasticity? So one of the, the probably the largest contributor of plasticity in human is sensory processing. Mm -hmm. We have to evolve and um, respond to everything in our environment. So anything we see, hear, touch, feel, this is what invokes plasticity and it guides mm -hmm. whatever we do with all of our behaviors. Um, as a model in mouse, olfaction is the biggest sensory modality. And so we can manipulate olfaction and understand how it changes brain connections associated with olfaction. For us, um, uh, a benefit of using olfaction in the mouse model is that olfaction guides many of their behaviors. It drives everything from feeding to mating to aggression to territory to, to memory. So um, it's, it's a direct inroad into using sensory modalities to uncover mechanisms associated with plasticity, which are largely conserved with the same exact signaling mechanisms in human. So I, the, I wanted to ask you about this, and I, I, I sent you a note to prepare you for this, because it's not in your field per se. Repertoire. For your repertoire. <laughs> but there's a lot of uh, uh, literature coming out, popular press coming mm -hmm. out on on the sociology and, and the behaviors that have taken place from the Gen Z crowd because of lack of ability to interact with uh, their peers mm -hmm. as they're growing up normally and instead having this platform which is a cell phone mm -hmm. or actually a smartphone even worse uh, that, that actually is their social social mechanism for growth. Is there, is there some way to be able to, I mean, from a neuroscience perspective, are there ways that, that support that? Or are there, is there any data from the neuroscience world that kind of looks at it not just from the obvious sociologic mm -hmm. issues? Yeah, this is, a, this is a loaded question. It's a loaded <laughs> this question. Is, this is the popular science, but also yeah. it is grounded in, in some reality. The, um, there's plenty of evidence in rodent models um, spanning from rats to mice that social deprivation or social isolation leads to profound effects, not only with their behaviors and their physiology, but actually the anatomy um, of these connections that are associated with plasticity that are uniquely susceptible during adolescence. So in a mouse, this would be after they're removed from their mother mm -hmm. and they're done weaning. Um, if you isolate mice compared to their cohorts or their siblings, these animals actually become withdrawn. They become, by all measures, anxious. They show signs of depression. Um, ironically, they have um, a, it's a little bit of a confound, but they, they show um, hyperlocomotion, which is similar mm -hmm. to ADHD, but at the same time, they're depressed. <laughs> this, is, I, this is a tough thing to deal with. <laughs> this is, I'm trying to think of the, 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 the key attributes of a president of a university, like ADHD and depression. I think pretty, right. much, pretty much summarizes it. Well, this yes, is fascinating. I mean, the work you do is absolutely incredible, and we're really excited to have you on the faculty and be talking about this. So thank you for joining us today. All right, I want to end this week with a couple of shout-outs. First of all, uh, this week, the U.S. News and World Report released the rankings of the best public high schools in America, and the Michael E. DeBakey High School for Health Professions is ranked number two in the Houston area. Uh, it's also uh, number eight in the state and 70th in the na nation among 17,000 schools. The school is also ranked 19th nationally in the magnet school category uh, of more than 850 schools. So congratulations to everybody at the DeBakey High School. I've mentioned this before, but that is a high school we started in 1972 in partnership with the independent uh, Harris uh, uh, County School District and is a great magnet school around STEM plus M, medicine uh, education. Also, congratulations to Dr. Ahmed Alderazi, a second-year resident in the Department of Medicine who won the Society of Hospital Medicine Clinical Vignette poster competition. And a shout-out to the family in Bahrain who also watches our family, our videos every week. So, hi, everybody in Bahrain. Uh, also, this week was Administrative Professionals Week, and so a big shout-out to all the administrative professionals at Baylor. <laughs> we couldn't do anything without you, and I'm sure you all know we wouldn't be able to do anything at all without you. Maybe you're all doing it, everything for us. And finally, of course, Monday marked the beginning of Passover, which ends on April 30. Happy Passover to all those who are celebrating this holiday, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <music>